In this episode, we'll be programming the collision response for our game. If you've been enjoying this series so far, consider triple smashing that like button. If you're one of the 82.1% that are not subscribed, consider subscribing as it does help the channel by giving me motivation. Hit the bell if you don't want to miss future episodes. So far, we've programmed what we need to find the intersection of moving axis aligned bounding boxes, but we don't have any code that describes what to do when a collision is detected. To determine our collision response and auxiliary code, let's think about the problem keeping our game type in mind rather than abstractly. In episode one, you would have seen the target game. It's an arcade style game with jumping and shooting. For this to work, we'll need a few things. Since we're jumping around, we probably need some concept of the ground or platforms. Since we don't want to fall outside of the level to the sides, we need some concept of walls. And the same can be said for the ceiling. Well, we can simplify all of those things into one idea, which is we want some collision bodies that don't move. They're static. Okay, so we know we need static bodies. What's next? Well, we probably want some kind of gravity and terminal velocity make entities fall when they're not standing on something. That's pretty much all we need for that. So let's head into the physics internal header and find somewhere to store our static bodies, our gravity and our terminal velocity. Add the three fields, two floats and an array list. Now head into physics.h and we can add a couple of things. We want a new type for our static bodies. Since they don't need any velocity or acceleration, we'll just start them with an axis aligned bounding box. Next, we'll want to store our static bodies separately. So we want two functions with exactly the same prototypes as the regular body functions. Finally, we want to add another property to the hit struct, a vector normal. This is where we'll store the side that the collision hit so we can tell how to respond. Open up physics.c and first up is implementing the two static body functions. They're almost exactly the same as the body ones. We're just going to use the new type and they're stored in the new array list we created. Calculating the normals is pretty straightforward in terms of code. First, we get the distance from the hit to the AABB on each axis. Then we subtract the absolute distance from the AABB half size. The reason we do that is to account for the shape being a non-square. The normal direction must be from the lower value. Here's an image on screen to help visualize what's going on. As you can see, after projecting PX and PY onto the same axis, PX is further to the left, therefore the normal must be on the horizontal axis. Finally, we need to set the normal. Since C has no sign function, we can just use this method. Uh, DX greater than zero in parentheses is converted to one if true and zero if false. Then we do the same for less than. This gives us minus one when the hit is on the left and one when it's on the right. The same works for the vertical axes. Now that we've calculated the normals, it's time to move on to the main physics loop. Head to the top of the file to define some variables. We want to set a U32 iterations to be two and then a float tick rate that'll be initialized in physics in it. These values determine how many times our collision detection should update per frame. With more iterations, there'll be more computation, but also more accurate collisions. With just one iteration, there is a corner case in which the algorithm responds by picking the wrong static body and pushing the moving body through the other static body. However, with multiple iterations, the response distance is shortened so that even if this happens, the moving body gets pushed partially inside on the first iteration and it will now be closer to the other static body and then be pushed back out before the frame ends. If the game has fast moving bodies that are acting strange, like going through objects, then turning this number up may help. Head to physics in it to initialize the static body array list, set the gravity, terminal velocity and tick rate. Now we can head to the main update function and start implementing our changes. First up, just delete the two lines that change the position. Positions will be changed via a couple of functions that we are yet to write. Then delete the delta time scalar from our acceleration change as that's gonna to be too slow. Create a new vec2 called scaled velocity. Pass scaled velocity into, unsurprisingly, vec2 scale to store the result of velocity times delta times tick rate. Finally, we wanna create a for loop. This is where iterations come in. We'll call two functions that we've yet to make in here. The order is important. As you can see on the screen now, having stationary first results in visible phasing through the object. The same is true for if you have no stationary response at all, though the results are different. Obviously, if you have no sweep response, we get the classic tunneling problem again. Before we jump into these functions, it's important to note that for games with more entities, there is usually an algorithm called a broad phase sweep, and that's run before anything that we do here. 
This section of the collision detection is generally referred to as narrow phase. These broad phase sweeps are used to grab only the bodies that are likely to be colliding with each other, as to not waste computation on checking collisions on bodies that are really far away from each other. For our simple arcade style game, we're skipping this step to make the implementation easier. Just keep that in mind if you decide to expand this example out into a larger game. Alright, let's first create the stationary response function. It's basically the same thing that we wrote a few episodes ago in the main.c file, but for all static bodies. First, we loop through each static body, then we calculate the Minkowski difference, passing in the static body first. Calculate the min and max of this new AABB. Finally, we do a simple range check to make sure there's a collision and then calculate the penetration vector and move the body back out by the penetration vector. This is the spot in the function that you could run another test or use recursion to see if the body is still inside any static bodies and then repeat until that's not true. I decided to go with the iteration method instead. Moving on to the sweep response function, we'll call another function that we have yet to make at the top and assign the result to a hit struct. If the hit is successful, we'll first set the body to the hit position. Then we'll increase the position by the velocity based on a check. If the hit normal on the horizontal axis is zero, then we know that we hit the side of something. Therefore, we only respect the vertical velocity and we zero out the horizontal velocity. Then we do the same thing for the other axis. If there's no hit, we respect both axis velocities. That's it. Let's create the sweep static bodies function now. In this function, we're going to run the ray versus ABB test that we created on every static body, keeping only the closest result. Create a hit struct to store our result and set the time to some large number by default. Next, loop through the static bodies, casting a ray against each one using the method we just covered. For this, we'll create yet another AABB. Just add the size of our AABBs together and keep the position of the static body. If there's no hit, we want to continue to the next static body. Otherwise, we check to see if the hit is sooner than our currently stored time. If it is, just assign the hit. If it's exactly the same time, we want to check which axis has the most velocity and then check if we're hitting the side that matches our velocity and use that hit. This way we solve for the most extreme velocity first and increase the stability of the system. We're now ready to test it all out. Head over to main.c and delete everything that was currently being displayed. Delete the SDL mouse button event, the position vector, the mouse state, we don't need any of that. Okay, let's update the input handle function temporarily to accept a body that we'll call body underscore player. Create two floats, vel x and vel y. Set vel x to zero and vel y to the current value of the body player's vertical component. We're going to update vel x and then set the velocity directly at the end of this function. This gives us unrealistic but very responsive movement. Rather than checking for both ks underscore pressed or held, we can just check for greater than zero. Now we'll do right and left inputs. We keep them in separate if statements so that if the user is holding both the left and right simultaneously, the resulting value is zero. If you don't do this, if you use an if else block, then you'll get whichever one you put in first, take precedence. So if you hold both buttons, it might still move to the right or still move to the left. And we do the same for up and down, except in up, we're not adding, we're just setting the velocity. Then we'll set the velocity on the player. Now back down in main, we wanna create a body for us to move around, which is the uh, body player, and five static bodies that will make up the floor, ceiling, walls, and a box in the center of the screen. Down in the loop, we want to get the pointer to each body by passing in the ID. Now the reason that we don't want to keep a pointer to the bodies is because they can be invalidated if the array list is resized. So if we have an array list of size eight, let's say, we fill it up and then we try to add another one, the array list will be resized and the memory might be somewhere totally different and our pointers will break. That's why we want to make sure we keep the IDs and then fetch the pointers. Now pass body player to input handle and then render all the AABBs and we're done. 